A very warm welcome to this webinar by the Mr. Geopolitics Research Program. This is part of a series that explores how climate security risks shape international cooperation. Uh, my name is Tim Suliada. I'm at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today as we navigate this kind of question uh, with a specific focus on decarbonisation and the challenges and opportunities that a changing geopolitical landscape brings. Uh, it's interesting to re reflect back on how different this landscape looked when we embarked upon the decarbonisation theme in this program. In February last year, we held a seminar with a room full of colleagues at the SEI offices. The EU had just released the European Green Deal and had pledged climate neutrality. On the agenda for that particular seminar was uh, the potential for European and Chinese cooperation on ambitious uh, climate action. The USA was conspicuously MIA. I don't need to recount exactly what happened next, but it's safe to say that we hadn't really anticipated the postponement of the Glasgow Climate Change Conference to this year, 2021. And I think anyone who had predicted that the China and the US would join the EU with their own net zero pledges would have really been considered a hopeless optimist. But uh, it's not all, of course, opportunities and glowing uh, uh, history. There are challenges to turning these kinds of pledges from the top into concrete plans for implementation. It's not an easy task. I can promise you that we're going to get into this today from a range of really interesting angles. We have a great lineup of, of speakers. So I can give you a sneak preview now to each of the, the speakers we have today. Uh, we we're, have the pleasure of uh, opening remarks from Johan Pilachena, who's the chair of the Swedish Climate Policy Council. We also have Jai Zhu, who is a researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, and he'll be uh, providing closing remarks and also they'll both serve as panelists. The researchers who have been part of the geopolitics of decarbonisation a uh, theme within our program, uh, Daria Ivleva, Andre Monberia, Taylor Dinsdale, and Carl Halding, and others as well. Uh, these are the speakers you'll hear from today. So now I'd like to give you a, a short introduction, if you'll bear with me, uh, to the program, Mr. Geopolitics. Mr. Geopolitics is an interdisciplinary research program that critically examines sustainable development in a changing geopolitical era and the new risks and opportunities that arise. Mr. Geopolitics focuses on the interaction between peace and security, human security, global environment change, and global governance. And we do this by focusing on three transformative processes. The transformative potential of the 2030 agenda, the rapid global environmental change and new emer and emerging technologies that shape the geopolitical landscape and the prospects for sustainable development. Our research focus areas include the geopolitics of decarbonisation, which is the primary focus of our seminar today, and also food security, sustainable oceans, and a big part of it is uh, foresight capabilities and uh, new and emerging technologies. Mr. Geopolitics is a consortium with both Swedish and international partners. And on the next slide, uh, you'll see the alphabet soup of the partners here. Uh, I won't go through each in, uh, and every one, but we have speakers from uh, most of those uh, partners today. So please have a look at our website. Uh, you have the, the link there. And also, uh, if you would like to uh, follow our uh, conversation on Twitter, then use the Mr. Geopolitics hashtag. So uh, today, we very much welcome uh, questions from the audience. So please post your questions using the Q&A function. On the right-hand side, you'll see a little chat box with a question mark inside. The meeting will be recorded and the recording will be available on the Mr. Geopolitics website. So without further ado, I would like to turn uh, to introduce our opening speaker, Johan Schielewena. Uh, 
Oh, I forgot to uh, make mention of our uh, team who's supporting also on the webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, Maria Cole, who's the communications lead, and Ian Coldwell, who's an information officer. Uh, they'll be making sure that uh, the, the seminar runs well today. So next slide, please. Uh, Johan Stilekwena, is we're very proud to have uh, Johan to uh, provide some opening remarks today for our webinar. Johan is the chair of the Swedish Policy Climate Policy Council, which is an independent expert body which evaluates how government policy is aligned with Sweden's net zero commitment by 2045. He is also an adjunct professor at Stockholm University. And he has the distinction of having launched the first phase of the Mr. Geopolitics program just over four years ago in Stockholm. Johan, over to you. Thanks a lot, Tim. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, it's great to be here this uh, this afternoon. I really looked forward to this seminar for quite some time now when you invited me. Um, I found it challenging to give uh, opening remarks in a topic which is clearly very complex and wide. So I look forward also not least to the presentation by the experts that we will have following some uh, opening remarks. As you said, uh, you know, I want to give some personal reflections, but I also was requested to give some background from my position as the chair of the Swedish Climate Policy Council, how some of these topics also fit into the work we do that in terms of evaluating Sweden and Swedish policies. Um, I was part of that launch and actually I must say I was really excited. I think the word coming back to me uh, from 2017 there is finally, you know, finally we start to discuss climate change and the whole transformation in the context where it belongs. I've been working with climate related issues, water related issues for the last 30 years. And it has most of those years been labeled as an environmental issue. And I think that this has partly been the problem. This was part of the problem, I would argue, that we didn't get a new agreement in Copenhagen in 2009. It was not seen as the major transformative topic that it needs to be as part of geopolitics. So in 2017, I think this program was extremely timely, no doubt. Uh, decarbonization is now clearly part of the new geopolitical landscape, as we will discuss today. And I think the focus on the EU and China and and, uh, and the US makes a lot of sense, of course. I, I catch the word new political landscape, but I, I think the word new is maybe wrong in many ways. I think the issue is constantly changing uh, geopolitical landscape. I mean, just take the relationship between China and the US in terms of international climate. Before Paris, you know, an agreement between these two countries were part of making sure that we could get the Paris Agreement. After that, we had Donald Trump and the shift happening during his presidency, and now we have Biden back. And again, we see new times of relation or new terms of relationship developing. I think you know it's really a very quickly moving and shifting landscape, uh, no doubt. Again, the focus on these three countries though makes a lot of sense because, of course, if they decide to work more closely together, they are part. They are, you know, a major part of the global economy. They are a major part of the global emissions, and they also, of course, host a major part of the global uh, private sector. Then we will have a move in the right direction. The, the rest of the world would align to a large extent if these three superpowers, if we call them that, would have a common goal and a common uh, sort of agenda and vision. Of course, there are others that I know you focus on as well, India, Russia, Brazil. But I think the focus here today in this particular uh, seminar is, uh, of course, very logical. The last couple of days I've seen a lot of interesting headlines, as you are aware, uh, and I'm not thinking mainly on those that relate directly to climate change. Yesterday, the whole spree of headlines related to the fossil fuel sector, with Shell and and uh, the court ruling with Exxon Mobil, where where there was almost like a coup from the shareholders to push in two uh, additional um, directors on the board of directors with independent roles of really pushing the company uh, in terms of climate uh, uh, policies and climate action and Chevron that were also the shareholders pushed the company to also have to consider scope three emissions, for instance. I mean, things are changing now so rapidly and so dramatically that it is difficult sometimes to follow the agenda. And it was also interesting then earlier 
uh, this year, or I would say last year, late last year, when the International Energy Agency came out with a report, put, you know, pointing to the fact that solar energy now is the cheapest energy form we've ever had. So this shifting landscape is, of course, extremely interesting and important to keep track on. In New York Times today, reporting on the new U.S. Uh, proposed budget for 2022, they highlight um, how Biden really pushes now to lift U.S. industry to better compete globally in an economy of that the administration believes will be dominated by a race to reduce energy emissions and combat climate change. So it's also at the center now of fiscal policies. So this highlights that we have many parallel agendas. We have the move out from fossil fuels, the move into renewable uh, energy systems, and of course also how the whole financial system is, is changing. These are, to a certain extent, parallel processes, but they are, of course, also intertwined. And this is exactly what Mr. Geopolitics is all about and why it is so important and timely. So this was just, you know, a couple of general remarks. I, and I know that this today's seminar today, we will touch upon many of these aspects of these issues, of course. But I was also reflect, uh, asked to reflect a little bit from the Swedish Climate Policy Council perspective and our evaluation there in 2021, we focused our evaluation very much on Swedish policies and government decisions re related to the pandemic and how these decisions and policies also contribute or counteract uh, the goals set by the Swedish parliament in the cl Swedish climate policy framework. Uh, again, what is interesting and also what I tried to allude to in my uh, or earlier is that today there is no separation really between climate actions and the whole transformation in other political areas and this integration of politics that climate politics is actually all politics is an important step forward and this is basically what our mandate is to make sure that all political areas also during a crisis are in line with the policy framework we looked at two dimensions, or the basis for our analysis were actually two dimensions. I mean, we can learn a lot from earlier crises, there's no doubt about it. In Sweden, the oil crisis led to probably one of the fastest transitions we've ever had away from fossil fuels. We had the structural economic crisis of the 1990s, where we established a finance policy framework, which really clearly demonstrated the importance of having long-term goals set for good policies similar to what we have now in the climate policy framework. Then we had the financial crisis uh, of the uh, late 20, uh, 28, 29. And of course, you know, a lot of people are now comparing what happened after the financial crisis and what can happen now after the pandemic. After the financial crisis, we also talked about green recovery. The OECD, for instance, talked about the green economy, really merging all the investments going into the economy with also an ambition to make it more green. We recognize this from today. We argue though that the situation today is different and it's better. And we talked about maturity and momentum in all this. And I would of course be very interested to hear from what others you know, think about the, this kind of analysis. But all overall, we argue that, that the, the fundamental changes that we have compared to back then at the financial crisis is that we have an aligned political framework or landscape. We have the Paris Agreement, we have national policy councils, we have clear ambitions at the regional and local level and of course also private sector today more and more aligning to the climate goals. This is very different from just 10 years ago. We have also the private sector as I mentioned who really pushes the agenda forward, take initiatives and drive the trans transition and transformation and changing the role of politics from being more of the driver to the enabler of, of change. We have also renewable energy systems that are competitive on a market base compared to fossil fuels, and we have popular support. So the whole maturity of the issue looks very different today compared to only 10 years ago. And we have the momentum, huge financial resources now being invested into society to address the crisis but of course also that could be used to drive the transformation to address the climate crisis. So we see both this maturity and momentum which is a unique window of opportunity that we argued um, exists right now. I will not go into our recommendations but this formed the basis for the recommendations we made in particular related to fiscal policies 
uh, etc. Uh, that the Swedish government has not included the climate aspects into uh, earlier. Finally, because I promise to keep this uh, opening remarks short, um, there are of course challenges, and I know that this is what we are go what you know, what we are going to talk about here as well in many of the of the presentations. So the emerging global trends right now that might hinder fast track decarbonization, the whole socioeconomic effects of facing out fossil fuels, is of course, something I know that many of the organizations are working on. The drastic scale up of renewable energy systems start to demonstrate also challenges, massive infrastructure investments causes a discussion of acceptance in Sweden, for instance, related to wind power. Um, but also solar. So we have moved from these being marginal energy or marginal parts of the energy system, and now they are supposed to be the massive bulk of the energy system. Of course, this creates challenges. The vulnerability in terms of raw materials that I know will be on the agenda here today, but also biomass, for instance, so both biomass and minerals. Um, and we need to focus really on the whole trade system as part of this that I know also Kalle will talk about and foreign direct investments. The whole re issue of resource efficiency that is not really on the agenda and International Energy Agency in their sustainability scenarios points to the fact that resource efficiency, energy efficiency is absolutely fundamental if we are to reach the climate targets. How can we get the investments to really address also these challenges related to uh, resource efficiency and energy efficiency? Sweden is in many ways in the middle of this agenda. It's no doubt about it. We are an export heavy country. We are dependent on, on, on the supply chains for our new industrialization that we see now, regardless if we're talking about steel industry or if we talk about uh, battery industry. Huge infrastructure investments are uh, needs to be done in terms of electricity, hydrogen, you name it. And of course, we also have a lot of big potentials, uh, potentials that can be realized if we have a well-functioning global system, global trade system, a fair trade system uh, that functions the way it is intended. But there can also be a lot of competition. So I'm sure that today's seminar will address these and many other aspects. These were some personal reflections. And I would like to end with the fact that I really strongly welcome, and you should know that I also I'm now part of the MISTRA board, but I really welcome the fact that Mistra Geopolitics has already been granted a second term, so I don't have to have a conflict of interest in this in this decision. So I really look forward to the results that will be presented also in the second phase of Mistra Geopolitics. So thanks, Tim. Back to you. Thank you very. Thank you very much, Johan, for that uh, uh, really interesting opening remarks. And you flagged uh, some interesting topics that uh, we will certainly be able to pick up uh, as we go into the panel discussion. And uh, uh, and we are also definitely welcoming everyone who is uh, here uh, joining the event to post your questions in there so that we can uh, take note of those and come back to them. Thank you very much, Johan. I'd like to I'd like to now uh, take the opportunity to introduce one of our uh, researchers uh, who has been a part of uh, the geopolitics of decarbonization uh, theme, Daria Ivleva, who is a senior advisor for Adelphi in the field of climate diplomacy. In the program, Daria is focused on, uh, among other things, the conceptual development of geopolitics of decarbonization and also trade and international investment implications. So I'd like to ask you, Daria, please, to uh, present your, your research. Excuse me. Um, hello. Thanks so much, Tim, for handing over. And today I will be focusing on the question why trade policy must con be considered, um, must consider the geopolitics of decarbonization. So this is one lens of looking at it. And my first slide is uh, just to introduce you to this um, concept, geopolitics of decarbonization. We've been working on this, trying to figure out what it means for us 
And uh, I think we see that geopolitics is a complex area in itself about international affairs interacting with geographies and decarbonization, as we've already heard, it's a cross cutting topic. It changes all of the society. It has political, economic and technological dimensions. But our basic contention, I would say, as a group is that these two complex areas interact and they shape each other. And we have explored some of the um, some of the different dimensions of how this interaction is manifested and what policy implication that brings. So on my next slide, you will see that um, trade is actually an interesting lens to look at those interactions and to try to understand them. And uh, I would like to, to offer you maybe a metaphor of um, trade as being a game of chess maybe. And um, I'm not a chess player myself, so I just hope it works more or less. And uh, the first dimension is the substance um, of trade, which would be chess pieces. Um, if, if you would click um, kindly, thank you. And um, the other dimension would be the institutions and the rules of trade. So maybe in our metaphor, the board that shows us how we're supposed to move, um, what, where can you go? Um, and the third would be transportation modes. So how do actually our chess pieces get from A to B? Which could be different. So in my presentation, I would like to take you through these three dimensions and just point to some of the issues that are interesting each and every one of them. And I'm sure the colleagues um, who speak after me will actually dig deeper in some of this of these aspects. So Ian, thank you. So some of the topics that we will present um, later on. Starting with uh, substance on my next slide. Um, I would um, say that most of the debate, as we already heard from opening remarks, revolves around commodities. So if to, to make it, to put it bluntly, some of them are high emission commodities such as fossil fuels, and we expect to decrease demand in those. And some of them are low emission commodities, um, commodities needed for um, decarbonization itself, so metals, rare earths, hydrogen, and we expect increased demand in those. And of course, we think about or debate about how um, these things pose an economic challenge or an economic opportunity and whether we can overcome some of the old dependencies and um, maybe some of new dependencies will be created. So the geopolitical dimension of this is, of course, wow, how does this change the international relations through this changing, shifting commodity trade? Going to the next slide, um, if you look at the institutions, we see that trade is governed by um, multi-layered, very complex trade regimes. And here we can ask ourselves how these regimes can be actually more supportive of more sustainable decarbonized trade and how this um, this can be more aligned with uh, the needs of of climate policy. But on the other hand, we also think about how these regimes can help us cope with the different risks that emerge through these shifting commodity trade um, commodity um, commodity trading and some of the issues that um, that are in focus here are, for instance, the WTO reform. So how the WTO could be a more aligned with climate policy, but also can it be a more effective way of governing the different um, transition processes that we are likely to be facing? But also it is about the climate change in uh, the climate change aspects in trade investment agreements. Um, you know that the EU is actually quite proactive in this and in general, a, an appropriate policy mix of boosting green trade because it's not going to be just up to the trade institution themselves, but also a wide range of economic politics. So on the next slide, um, and th we have we find our last dimension, the transportation. So the mode of trade, the physical mode of trade, so to say, we cannot imagine trade without transportation, unless it's digital trade, which is a different, which is a different topic maybe. But uh, you see that this sector is, of course, very easy to lock in because once you build the infrastructure, it's there and it locks you into a certain path. But it's also very hard to decarbonize and across countries. I think we will we do see um, a, a 
slower progress than in other sectors. And the international dimension of transportation only adds to those challenges. So if we were to embark on a decarbonization pathway, how do we govern this among different countries? So, you know, the, the whole road, so to say, from A to B actually can work as a decarbonized infrastructure. And this intersects uh, with the geopolitical agendas of countries. So we have different actors who push their connectivity agendas, and these have a geopolitical dimension. But how does this go along with uh, decarbonization imperatives? And one prominent example is um, China's Belt and Road Initiative. If you look at how China tries to conquer or maybe um, use the opportunities of the markets outside it and also connect into Europe. But what does it mean for, for the decarbonization of transportation sector um, in the countries where the initiative goes through, so to say, geographically? We'll hear more today on the Belt and Road Initiative, um, but on the energy dimension of this. So it just in my last slide, I would like to I would like to point to the fact that this, of course, trade and the trade lens of decarbonization of geopolitics is central to EU um, policies, first and foremost, because the external dimension of the European Green Deal is connected intimately with trade. Trade is central area to any external policy of the EU. And of course, the Green Deal itself states that um, for the EU as a global leader on the green agenda, uh, trade is just a very central instrument, both for the internal transformation because of course a lot of commodities need to come in through trade but also to um, to promote decarbonization outside of the US borders and if you look at from it um, at it from a different perspective not so much from the green perspective but from the trade perspective itself you also find that a lot of these questions that we've just discussed the new dependencies the risks how do you position it, uh, yourself as a trade actor um, these questions are already in the EU strategic thinking, and um, you can witness this in the trade policy review document, which is called an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy. And there you can really see how the EU grapples with those different goals um, and different um, different questions and bringing these um, being a promoter of open trade, but also protecting its own geopolitical interests. You will find some interesting language on this in this document. So thanks so much. This is um, so much for me, and I think uh, other speakers will elaborate on several of these aspects. Thank, thank you, Daria. Uh, thanks for setting the tone on the, the concept we're talking about here and also uh, elaborating on a very interesting analogy there. Uh, I would like to now turn to uh, Andre Monbea, who is uh, an Associate Senior Lecturer on, at Environmental and Energy System Studies in Lund University. Uh, in this program, uh, Andre has an uh, important part of his work is focused on the implication of decarbonization for raw material flows. So without stealing your, your thunder there, Andre, I'd like to hand over to you to uh, present your research, please. Thank you, Tim. So my presentation will focus on the metals that are used in low carbon technologies. And uh, in this research, we started from an observation that most of the previous research on geopolitics and natural resources focused on the role of fossil fuels. And we then asked, but what if we use renewable energy instead? Could the metals that are embedded in the renewable energy technologies result in similar dependencies as the fossil fuels? And are certain countries in the world more important than others for supplying these metals? And if so, is there a risk of a resource curse in these countries? So next slide, please. Uh, next uh, slide. So this figure here shows the global lithium demand in four different low carbon scenarios up to 2060. And we did this type of estimates for 14 metals uh, that are used in different renewable energy production, use or energy storage technologies. And each scenario starts from the same basic assumptions on the technologies that are similar as the current ones. But then as time goes on, we change the assumption for material efficiency improvements, recycling rates and so on. And these factors have changed in the past. And our research here shows the huge uncertainty of the future demand. Uh, it also indicates that there is substantial potential to reduce demand if we use the resources more efficient. Uh, next slide, please. We then looked at the geographical concentration of reserves for the metals that we included here. Uh, and this table compares the concentration for some of these uh, with oil that you can find up in the bottom row. Uh, 
And, and as you can see, the concentration for most of these, these metals are higher than it is for oil. And I can also add that we looked at the political stability. And for some of these countries, they're characterized as uh, fragile, which some import dependent countries see as problematic. So next slide, please. Uh, we then took our metal demand scenarios and we calculated the economic value of the metals and then allocated this value to different producer countries based on their share of the global reserves. And this enabled us to estimate how big the incremental metal revenues could be uh, compared to the size of these uh, countries' economies. And there is, of course, a huge uncertainty here. But in general, the peak values that we could calculate are rather low when we compare to the importance of oil for uh, some countries in the past. And if we take the next slide, uh, we can see that in our sample, we had a total of approximately 40 countries that we looked on, but there's only a group of five or so that have rather high revenues. And these are predominantly countries that are rich in lithium and cobalt, and most of them are uh, rather poor too. And I think it would be good to have a bit more detailed studies on this, uh, and then both for the metals and for the countries within this group. Uh, it's, I would also like to emphasize that it's important to keep in mind that this is at the country level, but mining uh, can take place in a local and remote area where its impact can be influential for that area. And the effect of the local impact is something that we did not study. If we then take the next slide, uh, so another aspect of the resource concentration is to what extent the metal exporters uh, or the metal exports can be used as a foreign policy tool and how this compares with energy. And this figure here shows the Chinese export of rare earth elements and their share of the global market. And China used to dominate the market, uh, almost the sole supplier, up until about 10 years ago. And at that time, China reduced their mining and exports. And there are some different stories of why this happened, but some draw the connection to a border dispute that took place with Japan. And in the short term, the price increased dramatically. But as you can see, the Chinese market share has since declined as other countries have ramped up their production. Uh, next slide, please. So can the metal rich states use their exports as a foreign policy tool? Well, I think that there are some different arguments in the literature on this. But the difference can partly be explained from the time frame. So in the short term, yes, it is possible, but it seems difficult to succeed in the long term. And this is a result of the uh, possibilities with substitute, recycling and so on. And these possibilities provide a very different dynamic than what has been the case with oil in the past. So next slide, please. So to summarize and conclude, I would say that the resource demand is uncertain due to technological development, available substitute and recycling. And to some extent, these factors respond to market price signals if or when price uh, when problems arise. Uh, there are some new countries that will gain in importance as resource suppliers, and some of these are considered to be fragile. Uh, but the, there are low revenues for most of the exporters on a country level although the local situation can be different. And it seems difficult to successfully use the metal exports as a foreign policy tool, at least in the long term. So thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you, Andre. Uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, you've highlighted some uh, points which I'd like to bring up in the panel discussion, particularly about the uh, the new countries that may gain importance in the resource suppliers. But let's continue with our presentations. Everyone's keeping uh, time like clockwork, so I very much appreciate that. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Taylor Dimsdale, who's the Program Director uh, on Risk and Resilience at E3G. He's been active uh, in this research program on looking at risks posed by climate change for the financial system and also how key technological shifts may play out. Taylor, please, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Tim, and very nice to be with you all today. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, Tim, as Tim's mentioned, our research um, in this context really was looking at the geopolitics of electric vehicles. And specifically, I think we were trying to answer was seemingly a fairly straightforward question, which was how countries might respond in a scenario where there is very rapid uh, 
um, and significant uptake uh, of electric vehicles globally. Um, and if we move to the first slide, uh, we started just by looking at some of the trends and forecasts and drivers. Um, I think even the most conservative forecasts were showing significant growth in electric vehicles. It's actually easier in many ways to make EVs than, than conventional vehicles. Um, batteries are really the largest cost and like wind and solar technologies, those have fallen pretty dramatically in recent years. Um, so when our report first came out in 2019, I think the predictions were essentially that you would see cost competitive EVs even without subsidies in the early 2020s. And I think that has that has remained the case. And so you saw all of the major forecasters really having to consistently revise their forecast upwards, um, which has often been the case with renewable technologies historically. Um, there are challenges, of course. Uh, you know, it needs the charging infrastructure, of course, behind it. Um, people, some people have range anxiety and, and things like that. Um, but basically, our, our analysis of the sort of technology in the market was that if you're just looking at those factors, there are good reasons to believe that um, not only is this transition going to continue, but that it could actually happen um, faster than some of the mid-range forecasts would project. So if we move to the next slide, um, of course, it's not just technology and market factors. What you've also had is um, more political or policy-based drivers. Um, and essentially, this has now been identified as a strategic industrial priority by quite a few countries, including um, the US, EU, and China. So when we wrote our report a couple of years ago, it was really China having taken the lead. They identified um, what they are calling new energy vehicles uh, as, as one of their big uh, industrial priorities for the future. And then you have the European Union, I would say, to some extent, you know, playing catch up, also identifying this as an important opportunity. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, France and Germany working together, putting some real money behind trying to make Europe uh, a leader in battery technology, for example. Uh, meanwhile, at the time, of course, this wasn't a big priority for the Trump administration, to say the least. And if you talked about electric vehicles in the US, many people would love to point out that the most popular selling car here was still the Ford F-150 pickup truck, which is decidedly not an electric vehicle. Um, but of course, if you fast forward to today, um, one of the big changes, as people have already mentioned, uh, is Biden's election in the U.S. And some of you, some of you may have seen just a couple of weeks ago, um, the president uh, gave a speech about this while test driving an electric Ford F-150 um, and explicitly saying that they are now in a race, that the U.S. is now in a race with China. And there's about close to $200 billion in Biden's infrastructure plan for encouraging the uptake of electric vehicles in the U.S. So you now have the world's three largest economies really all having identified electric vehicles as a strategic priority and also trying to come to terms with whether they are competitors uh, or partners or some combination of the two. So if we move to the next slide, um, essentially one of our conclusions from the report was that a lack of preparedness for this kind of high electric vehicle scenario, as we're calling it, um, increases the risks of geopolitical tensions due to the disruption. Um, and if we move to the next slide, and apologies that it's not very easy to read this, um, but essentially we, we identified sort of four mechanisms um, where EV adoption could influence geopolitics. So the first being on international trade, um, and it could go either way, right? I think uh, on the one hand, you know, EV costs need to decline quite dramatically to meet their full growth potential and contribute to meeting the sustainable development goals, for example, that would imply a deepening of global supply chains as well as regulatory and market integration, which could prompt a sort of a new rise in green free trade agreements. On the other hand, um, you know, we've seen what happens uh, when uh, a country starts to mass produce a technology very cheaply, for example, with solar tariffs um, just a few years ago. So it could also result in trade tensions. Um, with respect to energy security, uh, of course, if electrification reduces oil demand, um, that means public revenues from oil could decline in producer countries. Many of those are in um, uh, regions already at risk of instability. It could result in a rebalancing of key geopolitical dynamics between producers and consumers, including the US and China. Um, the third was on resource scarcity. So I wouldn't see this as a high probability scenario, but the need for some of these new materials and minerals could certainly have knock on effects, one of which being you know, access to these elements being used as oil has been for energy statecraft, um, which speaks to some of the, the research that Andre was just talking about. Um, and then second, the potential interaction of the demand for these minerals um, 
uh, with state or regional instability. So many of them are found in parts of the world um, that have poor governance records or are at risk of, of instability. And then finally, um, we sort of looked at second and third order effects more generally. So um, there's one estimate that you could have $20 trillion in revenue um, disappear from the oil industry by 2040. Um, clearly, that's going to have knock on effects, um, particularly for um, you know, tax revenues in oil producing states again, but it also carries risks for institutional investors and pension funds and um, and all sorts of other parts of the financial system that could have um, that could have even uh, human security implications. So what could we do about it? Um, if we move to the last slide, uh, we did try to come up with some recommendations for, for trying to manage this uh, transition. So one of which was just working together on trade. Um, and there is a process underway through the WTO uh, on environmental goods, of course, that has been sort of stalled for, for a long time. But could you come up with some sort of multilateral um, free trade agreement on electric vehicles by solving some of these disputes around what sort of state support is considered fair, um, for example? Um, uh, we thought harmonizing regulatory um, uh, approaches and standards uh, would be necessary. Um, I think scaling up research and development cooperation, um, for example, through things like mission innovation, um, uh, could spill over into other areas. So I think one of the best ways of promoting cooperation is to find a specific thing to cooperate on, and sometimes that has a sort of domino effect. Um, we also recommended um, countries stress testing their sort of foreign policy and security strategies against this high EV scenario. Um, we've suggested uh, the G20 or other sort of um, developed countries working to improve uh, resource governance in some of these fragile states. And then the last recommendation being um, helping uh, particularly some of the high cost oil producers with risk assessments and transition strategies where they really don't have um, many other options at the moment. Um, so I'll stop there, um, but uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, fascinating uh, to, to hear about the two different pathways that uh, uh, disorderly or orderly transitions could take. And uh, I would like to move directly into our uh, next presenter, and that is uh, Carl Halding, the Senior Research Fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute. I understand, uh, Carl, that you will share your screen. So while I introduce you, perhaps uh, please uh, try that first. Uh, in the program, Carl has focused on uh, a lot on foresight and scenario approaches which has been an important aspect of uh, the, the Mr. Geopolitics program. And he's also looked uh, quite deeply at technology and investment issues uh, uh, with a, a focus on China. So uh, can I hand to you, Carl, to uh, take us through your presentation, please? Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. And um, uh, thanks a lot for uh, providing me the space to present this fascinating research. We're just wrapping up here. Um, where we look at, uh, well, look, try to look at uh, Chinese investments abroad and to what extent these are green or brown. And uh, I hope you could all see uh, my presentation now. Um, so I think this is, is something which um, reflects uh, the power of narratives uh, in the international scene and the role of narratives in shaping uh, geopolitics and, and geopolitical um, 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 how, how geopolitics are, are, be, are being shaped. Um, I, I think also this uh, narrative, this story about Chinese outward investments uh, is worth reflecting on from a perspective of more constructivist ideas of how we could solve the climate crisis or more realist uh, uh, ideas about how to move ahead and particularly in this triangulation between China, Europe and, and the US. So um, is China's en energy investments abroad, are they green, and, uh, green or, or brown? Well, particularly if we look at what China has said, uh, Xi Jinping has called what the, the Belt and Road Initiative for green, healthy, intelligent and peaceful. And predominantly China has uh, presented its ambitions uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is essentially Chinese outward investment, as something to boost green development and bring prosperity around the world, particularly in developing countries. So how does this hold? Uh, 
Well, we all know that China is a big actor when it comes to renewables. They're the biggest producer on components for wind and solar. They're big on green, uh, low carbon infrastructure, such as the rapid train transport and so on. Uh, what has been less known, maybe, um, we all know that China is big on coal, but uh, that is mainly in China. Uh, what has been less known is Chinese, uh, uh, that China is big when it comes to uh, building new coal power outside of China. And this is a prospect for a big um, big coal power plant in South Africa. So what, what we've done here is to try to compare promises and realities. We've done so uh, looking at uh, investment streams and analyzing outward investment streams and comparing them to what we could find out of looking at content from Chinese media and international media. And here we used um, AI uh, driven uh, content analysis. Uh, on the investment streams, we've looked at three different uh, uh, globally available databases. The China Global Power Database from Boston University um, is specifically looking at all different outward investment from China in the power sector. Um, we have reviewed the Global Coal Public Finance Tracker, which is set up by the Global Energy Monitor. It's a um, big, um, big database with an, uh, essentially all um, coal power plants around the world uh, listed, um, more of which now about 217 are Chinese projects. Uh, then we looked at a, a broader uh, database called the China Global Investment Tracker by the American Enterprise Institute. It's a big database on any kind of outward investment from China from nine, 2005 and onwards. The content-based analysis will review Chinese Chinese language articles, over 7,000. Uh, Chinese English language articles, um, it's about 550 articles. And in that international English language articles, that's 4,600 articles. So this is it's a lot of, of, of content analysis uh, where uh, an AI-based uh, platform makes it possible to actually look through all of these in a, in a quantitative uh, way where you could draw qualitative analysis. And we're doing this work together with our partners at Decipher Analysis, uh, Decipher Analytics, uh, sorry. So what um, are we looking at? We're looking at the Belt and Road Initiative, and we're particularly, just to illustrate uh, what's happening here, we look at the uh, red arrow here. It's a part of the Belt and Road Initiative called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, China is investment around, investing around 50 billion US dollars in, in this corridor, corridor for transporting things. So what is happening inside of that corridor? If we just review that little part, uh, we could see that uh, of the uh, infrastructure investment projects, a majority of those are actually new coal power and very little is, uh, is solar and wind. Uh, there is a bit of hydropower as well. Uh, but the energy backbone that China is investing in here is essentially a coal and carbon based uh, uh, system. Uh, if we look broader around the world, these are uh, new um, uh, coal power plants around the world that are in planning. Uh, and if we look at China's share of these, Chinese investments go into the majority of these. These are the future investments by Chinese finance around the world for new coal power. China is definitely big player when it comes to coal power. If we then review uh, how much uh, investment that has gone into different uh, fuel uh, source uh, power uh, generation here, and these are aggregate numbers, I will uh, have to emphasize that, we see that coal is really dominating uh, the picture, uh, followed by big scale hydro, which is often uh, uh, problematic as such, and then gas uh, as a big uh, investing um, stream as well. Uh, what we call the renewables here uh, are really uh, much less uh, in the Chinese portfolio outward investment. So let's, let's contrast this with what we find from the content analysis. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, coal is not the major topic in, in Chinese media. It's a bigger topic in international media. Whereas non-fossil is, is really dominating uh, in China and also in, in, in international media. So reading these media, you get a picture of Chinese investments are, are predominantly uh, non-fossil investments. Interestingly here, um, nuclear is, is really showing up in Chinese media. 
uh, also to a certain extent in international media, although nuclear uh, represented very little share of, of Chinese actual output investments. And uh, I think this is a re reflection of uh, the, the importance that is connected to nuclear power in China domestically. Uh, and also that uh, those projects have been uh, flagship projects, uh, which some of the, which never came into fruition. So that's why they have uh, attracted a lot of, of attention. Also, interestingly, uh, gas doesn't show up at all in, in Chinese language media. Uh, it's a big part of, of Chinese output investments. It's also, also just a minor reflection in Chinese English and international media. Well, that's the um, uh, number of articles. How are these uh, things then described? Dirty and sustainable or clean and sustain, uh, dirty and unsustainable or clean and sustainable. So looking at Chinese media, uh, the major tone here is that these are clean and sustainable investments. Uh, very little reflection about uh, that these could be dirty and unsustainable. Uh, looking at international media, we have much more of a balanced view. Uh, um, um, more than half of the articles reflect on, on, on these investments uh, being dirty and unsustainable. Uh, digging deeper into to, uh, the analysis, we looked at specific topics that are then coming out from the AI based analysis. We look at the topic dams and hydropower projects in Southeast Asia. And in Chinese media, these are um, being presented as helping water conservancy. These are re uh, about responsible stakeholders the good environment impact assessment done, whereas uh, overrepresentation in international media is about damage, it's about uh, deforestation, these are controversial projects affecting civil society, having environmental impacts and so on. Another topic here, uh, Chinese coal power exports. Uh, in China, these are, in Chinese media, these are uh, presented as environmental friendly, uh, high utilization rate, it's clean power, uh, clean coal, uh, whereas in international media, you see another type of rep representation on the topic, more about how Chinese uh, export exportation of overcapacity, uh, the Chinese financing dirty coal over the world, um, and this these investments are slowing the green shift. Uh, so this, I think, these um, um, I, I, this give you a little bit of, of an idea of different narratives here, um, and uh, maybe narratives that. Uh, are worth reflecting upon um, in, in terms of you know what type of narratives are are, are reflecting the, the geopolitical situation that we need to face uh, to, to 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 drive a rapid uh, transition. Some conclusions: um, there is a huge gap, of course, between uh, the Chinese promises for green development um, and rea realities as we see them re being reflected by uh, looking at the real investment streams. And the narratives that emerge from Chinese media communicate this very strong focus on green investments uh, and that these investments are leading to prosperous developments around the world. But even in international media, there is a clear overrepresentation on reporting on Chinese green investments uh, as compared to what you could see from the real investment streams. And um, finally, uh, although we didn't have time to look at the time series here, uh, the gap between narratives and realities are rapidly closing in, in international media, where we see in later years, particularly last the last uh, the 12 to, to um, uh, 18 months, uh, uh, a rapid increase in critical articles about Chinese outward investments. I stop there and hand back to you, Tim. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, very interesting and, and nice uh, slides as well. Uh, so now we'll return to the uh, the main presentation, I believe, uh, and uh, moving right along to our uh, second to final session in this uh, webinar. And uh, this is the panel discussion and, and Q&A. We've already received some uh, questions uh, posted there, so thank you for those, and we're welcoming uh, more now. Uh, while you're thinking about it and while I ask each of the panelists to make their turn on their videos, uh, so it's like a real panel. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the the final guest uh, for our uh, seminar today, uh, Jai Zhu, who is uh, a researcher at CPRI Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, 
in the program, uh, JE has focused uh, uh, a lot on uh, the uh, geopolitics of food security. Uh, JE will give uh, closing remarks, uh, but uh, we'd like to invite uh, JE to uh, pose the first question uh, to one of our panelists uh, here, please. JE, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Tim, um, and thanks to the Mr. Organizers and for all the panelists for such a rich uh, discussion and a rich set of results on such important issues, I think, um, at the intersection of, of geopolitics and uh, climate policy, which, uh, as Johan mentioned in the beginning, has become so integrated. Um, so my question uh, is in relation to that uh, integrated agenda, I, I think that um, it comes with a lot of opportunities um, in terms of the importance of climate and environmental environmental issues uh, on, on high level political uh, um, agendas, but also with some perils. Um, I will, I'm sensitive to the time, so to focus on potentially some opportunities, um, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists whether or not they see, uh, even within the framework of heightened strategic competition uh, between the major powers, whether or not there is a possibility um, for a race to the top or as has been mentioned, a race to reduce uh, in kind of the same way we've seen um, uh, competition uh, channel more uh, um, attention and investments and financing into infrastructure, uh, overseas development finance, things like that. Um, we know the US and, and China right now are engaged in a, a battle of narratives, a uh, battle of discussions about global leadership and responsibility, but whether or not that translates also into higher ambitions, um, uh, whether or not the panelists could discuss what, what they see uh, the potentials to be there. Thank you, Jay. Uh, that's a very good question, and I think it goes to the heart of uh, the the cooperation competition uh, uh, that we see playing out here, and we've heard today in our speak uh, from our speakers. Uh, so uh, that that's a, a exciting, optimistic note to begin on. So, would uh, one of the panelists uh, like to answer Jay's question about the potential for a race to the top? I I could take a first stab on 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 that, and um, I'm. Uh, uh, reflecting on 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 uh, transatlantic dialogue that I sat in uh, on on yesterday, um, discussing particularly the geopolitics of of climate change and and sort of the same topic as we have here today. Uh, I, I think the the um, there is a strong uh, the, there were two two groups of people there. One group proponing. Uh, a proponent of, of, you know, we have to find a common ground within the UNFCCC. We have to set a common uh, standards for that, and we have to work through the UNFCCC here so to get everyone on board. And there was another camp, much more realist camp, that said that, well, it, it, it's all in the hands of the US and, and, and in Europe now. It can set the rules, can move ahead. Uh, and do that through trade policy instead of working through the UNFCCC. And then, of course, everyone uh, understands that there is a middle ground. You have to work maybe both these arenas. But I think that was an interesting um, observation uh, from my side here, that there are you know two, two ideas of how to move ahead here, given that we have a new geopolitical situation with, with Biden uh, now in, in the White House. Mm. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Daria, would you like to comment on that? I can only support that actually because um, I would also see that the danger of work well or the the um, you cannot turn a blind eye on all these uh, different um, agendas such as the trade agenda and its geopolitical components which I think this group is kind of all about that we're trying to raise awareness for this um, for this aspect but on the other hand of course the UNFCCC can create um, what well, is a very valuable forum and there can be a mutual reinforcement, so to say, if um, we do, if we manage to play those different games on those different levels in appropriate, in appropriate um, forum, so to say, and um, always being conscious of the geopolitics behind it, um, if that's, if that's um, a helpful comment. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Daria. Uh, anyone else like to uh, add their, their two cents on that? before I go to another question. 
Johan, please. We can hear you now. Can you? Yeah. Yes. Ah, okay, because it says unmute still. <laughs> Um, well, um, I, you know, just adding to these really good points, I, what I was also trying to reflect upon is, you know, the quote from from the U.S. the fact that Biden clearly puts into uh, his budget for 2022 that this is about competitiveness for for U.S. industry is one positive example. Um, you know, we we see a completely different force. While we before looked at very much, you know, politics, we have now different actors and in particular the market driving the whole shift. There are challenges with this, no doubt. And we, you know, we talked about some of them today, but I think fundamentally the, this represents a very important shift in how policy is made and a difficult change for politicians. As I mentioned, you know, moving maybe away from being those that, you know, are they're used to making the decisions and driving this to more being the enablers of the change that we see more coming bottom up than, than top down. So I think that there is a very positive shift here. Uh, and, you know, we move away from carbon tax, a global carbon tax is the only viable solution to a more, much more multi landscape, which I think is more interesting to a certain extent. Thank you, Johan. Uh, let, let me uh, uh, move along to uh, a question which I'd like to pose uh, to the panel and uh, I welcome responses from uh, everyone because I think it uh, has a, a relevance uh, to explain what we're talking about here in more detail. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I'm, I'm conscious that it would be very uh, good to uh, find some concrete examples of uh, a country uh, or, or other uh, actor in which uh, this competition and cooperation between the EU, US and China is playing out. Uh, I think uh, for each of the remarks that we heard, uh, there's some um, very interesting uh, uh, aspects that we can dig into if we focus on individual countries. And uh, I may uh, start with you, Andre, if I could. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you made mention of uh, new countries that will gain importance as uh, resource suppliers. I think it would be great to hear uh, uh, which countries you have in mind there. And uh, we have two uh, questions related to your presentation that were posted uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Jörg Stordenmann, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, this is a re question regarding uh, tax havens and, and resource-rich uh, countries, and Nina Bondre. Uh, and this uh, relates to uh, the fact that mining is carried out often by uh, private companies. Uh, so a uh, question about how uh, private uh, actors play into this, so not just countries. Andre. Yeah, uh, thank you. So when it comes to these different uh, metals, and uh, there are a few different countries for the different metals, I would say. So, for example, if we take the lithium, then South America, like uh, Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina, is often considered to be like a, a lithium triangle, where we have the big resource concentration of low-cost lithium. There are lithium in other countries too, but it's very uh, easy to extract it at a low cost from these countries. Um, for the cobalt, it's Congo, of course. Uh, a country which is perhaps not spoken that much about, it's South Africa, which has a lot of uh, platinum. And it could be important if we have more hydrogen, either for the fuel cell vehicles or for the industry. Uh, and in the estimates that I have, uh, this was done a few years ago, uh, and we have fairly low assumptions on the hydrogen use. So if we would have redone this uh, study today and looked on the industry transition, uh, which we did not include, then we would probably uh, increase these uh, revenues for South Africa quite a bit. EU is an import dependent country. So uh, Sweden is one of the few countries in, in the EU where we have quite a lot of mining. So for the EU as a whole, it will of course be important how these uh, networks at the global scale or if it would be bilateral negotiations with these countries. Now, when it comes to this with the, the mining, uh, I, I mean, yes, sure, the, the mining is done by, by private companies, uh, but still uh, there is taxes on the mining, uh, on, and that can be a different way of having those type of regulations. Uh, in Sweden, it's 
fairly low or very low, I should say, uh, based on the, the value of what is uh, in the metals. Uh, but some other countries have substantial uh, fees that you need to pay to the government. So in some way, there is still uh, money that is going back to the government budget. Uh, and it could be at different levels. Sometimes it's more at the local, some have it at the state. So there are different regulations for that. Uh, this with the tax new, uh, havens and so on, I think that that is a bit outside the scope of my core research because most of my core research has been on the critical materials and the critical materials, uh, they are usually not that important when it comes to the uh, total carbon emissions that they are uh, part of. I mean, they're used in very small quantities. The uh, materials, the bulk materials like aluminum, iron and so on, concrete, that's where we see the really big uh, emissions and we touched upon this in one of the reports that we have and how this relates more to the carbon leakage problem and so on uh, and if there is a, a need for some type of carbon adjustment tariffs and so on and uh, I don't have a clear answer to that I think that it's a huge uncertainty for these industries if you have them within uh, like Europe for, for instance and you have these big investments that they need to make uh, in order to have these low carbon uh, low carbon materials. At the same time, the materials are usually a very small part of the total product value. So it's it's not necessarily that expensive for the end user uh, to internalize the cost, but there needs to be some institution in place to do it. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, I'd like to turn to Taylor uh, now uh, to because some of the materials you mentioned are, are quite uh, relevant for, uh, well, electric vehicles, but also fuel fuel cell vehicles, perhaps a little bit outside the scope. But would you like to reflect on the, on the materials uh, uh, in your scenarios you've looked at, uh, or perhaps you'd like to talk instead about uh, a particular country uh, that it might be uh, that the US, EU, and China might be dependent on in in uh, this competition that they're they're quite explicitly um, outlining now. Sure. I mean, there is um, quite a bit of overlap, um, clearly, with some of the countries that Andre has been looking into in terms of where some of these minerals are uh, are produced. Um, you know, whether it's cobalt or uh, or nickel or lithium, and you know, places like um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is is a big one where I think that there are clearly sort of national and international security interests that all of these actors have in terms of uh, trying to maintain stability um, in some of those in some of those regions. Um, but, you know, I certainly I think that the sort of transition towards electrification will have pretty significant implications in terms of the sort of geopolitical positioning of all of these of all of these actors. So, I mean, one of the reasons um, for example, you know, China, I think, identified electric vehicles as one of these 10 uh, advanced industries as part of the Made in China 2025 plan. Um, I think what some of the rationale behind that was that, you know, China is tired of relying on the U.S. for protection of global oil supply chains, right? So the U.S. has seen that as a strategic advantage historically. Um, I think China sees um, the control and production of some of these new clean energy supply chains, including around battery production, um, as, a, as a potential strategic advantage in the future. And clearly that reshapes um, both the relationship between the sort of three major powers that we're looking at today, but then on downwards, you know, downstream in the supply chain where some of the minerals and, and metals are also being produced and you have big changes in the relative sort of geopolitical attention being played to regions like the Middle East, for example, relative to some parts of, of Africa or, or Latin America. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I would just say, you know, I think that there, there are big changes already underway. And, and part of that purpose of, of the paper was to, was to try and highlight that as an area where, you know, you need to try and identify some concrete venues or opportunities um, to start to cooperate um, on some of these on some of these questions, because I think just based on the status quo, um, I would have I would have concerns uh, about where we end up, despite some of the very positive developments in the financial markets, for example, that we've seen. Mm 
Thank you, Taylor. Uh, I, I, I would like to, to now turn to uh, Carl and Daria. To uh, in, We only have a couple of minutes left for this panel discussion, I'm afraid. Uh, but there's a question in the chat about uh, uh, climate change being uh, one of the few remaining uh, areas of cooperation uh, that, uh, between the US and China. Uh, is, is this realistic? Uh, I wonder if you may uh, like to comment on, on that. Uh, the question is by uh, Maria, Marion Gefraut. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, sorry. Um, I I think it you know may have looked like that um, when when uh, there was an agreement between uh, Biden and, and and Xi Jinping here before Biden's big climate meeting that China and, and US should work together uh, in you know in in the world. I didn't see any. Re realism behind that. I don't know how or on what basis they should cooperate uh, actually. Um, but uh, it's important for them, these both parties to to uh, pr provide an image of them as as you know working together. I think, however, it should be very important to bear in mind that um, Xi Jinping has developed a, a number of, of strategic um, underpinnings for Chinese uh, engagement with the world. Uh, one of them is uh, an offer uh, to work on issues of common destiny, to jointly work together on issues of common destiny, while at the same time uh, keeping sovereignty of states uh, at a very high level. That means cooperate on climate change, but don't talk about human rights, don't talk about freedom of open speech, don't talk about democracy, and don't talk about open free trade. And then on, on that premises, I don't think there is a basis. There is not the common idea of a rules-based system in which China and US could cooperate. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Dario, would you like to add any points there or any other reflections? Oh, sorry. To promote uh, my own report on Kazakhstan, uh, where in uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative in Kazakhstan, the so one of the big points there was also to say, yes, we do have to look at what China's interest is behind the, the Belt and Road um, Initiative and the EU, for the focus was on the EU there, or China have to take, um, be aware of that. But also um, there is another side of the on, on, on of the China's investment abroad, and this is the countries where it is invested. So I do think that if, well, this is not exactly an answer to the question in the chat, but maybe um, it, well, I would say one was also one also needs to to see this other cooperation route, so to say, so where you or the US can cooperate with third countries where China is investing heavily and how we can shift the incentives for um, decarbonized investment there uh, to make maybe China or um, or you or US um, to make an alternative um, offer, for instance, on the on the energy side, on the transportation side, on the industry side. So this is also an important aspect um, from my point of view. Yeah, very good point. Uh, thank you, Daria. Uh, now, uh, we have sadly come to the conclusion of our panel discussion. I'm glad everyone had a chance to, to speak. I'd now like to uh, uh, reintroduce Jay Yizhu to please uh, provide some final remarks. Your reflections on today, no pressure. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, there's no way I can provide any sort of summary, but um, uh, it's been such a great conversation and I, I would like to just uh, raise uh, three broad reflections um, from the discussion. The first, uh, I think, is on sort of this tension uh, related to interdependency. I think mo many of the uh, panelists have highlighted, um, you know, the perils, the risks, uh, geopolitical and otherwise, uh, related to the fact that we do have um, really integrated uh, supply chains, really int uh, integrated uh, economies. And, and part of the, the dynamics that you do see in this new geopolitical environment, whether or not it's a new one or if it's just a more turbulent one, is that uh, a lot of countries and actors have um, been moving towards mitigating those risks and, and reducing interdependency. Uh, so you have this uh, broader shift towards uh, shortened supply chains, uh, diversification, uh, 
in terms of, uh, you know, the EU's new focus on strategic autonomy uh, or not so new, um, but also investing in, in, in R&D and in innovation locally, uh, domestically. Um, but I think that the, the tension that I, I, I find and in, in a really interesting one, and I, I don't think any of us necessarily have an answer, is that the reason why we're discussing all these things uh, together um, uh, is because of, of the interdependencies of, of the climate system. Um, the fact that this is one planet we're living on. So in a sense, policies by one country, even if they are so-called domestic, even if they are about competitive advantage, uh, that impl uh, implicates all of us uh, altogether. Um, but you know, then one caveat there is that we don't all have the same vulnerabilities. Um, and I think that that's a really important point in terms of, of climate risks. Uh, you know, there are, there are countries that may, may benefit uh, more than others um, from the changing climate uh, in many, many countries that have uh, a lot of uh, uh, higher risks. And I think that that also needs to be in, in direct focus. Um, a second point um, is a more pessimistic one. I think the first question that I asked about this race to the top, um, I think highlighted it, it was in line with this, uh, this broader point about the integration of climate and environmental issues with politics. Uh, and to the extent that that's an opportunity is great, but uh, I think I would like to echo what Kala said, that there are uh, perils with that. Um, uh, we can't really, uh, and especially in what you see in geopolitics today, is that these things are not necessarily being separated. Uh, broader issues of, of political governance, human rights, uh, transparency, uh, industrial and technological um, competitiveness and competition. Uh, these are uh, becoming integrated as well uh, into the broader discussion of, of climate leadership, um, of, of economic uh, models, things like that. And John Kerry uh, recently suggested that climate was a standalone issue that could be seen apart from the difficulties of the US-China relationship broadly. But I think that, that that's that's really an open question. Uh, even um, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi uh, seemed to suggest that uh, China sees these things as also part of a, a broader game. And I think that that's something we, ha we have to look closely at together um, uh, in terms of uh, being clear-eyed clear about, about risks and, and the potential challenges to, to deeper cooperation. And then a third point, um, I think, which uh, for me is also not something that I have any um, clear uh, idea about, but I think it's, it's the question of governance. Um, and I, I think it's, it's so important to focus on, of course, these major actors of the EU and China and, uh, and the US because they are such uh, strong and important players in, in shaping global go governance norms and rules. Um, but I think it's so necessary to, 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 to broaden that out because the past uh, four years under Trump, I think, really highlighted to the rest of us the risk of, of taking you know, only one leader or only one person setting the norms or standards, I think it has to be diversified. It has to be broadened and shared. And those, that, that conversation about who governs and who shapes those rules, uh, it has to include uh, uh, countries like Sweden um, and, and many, many others, uh, emerging economies, developing ones. Um, and so I, I'd like to just leave it with that, that there's so many open questions, um, but I think that this conversation has really high highlighted many of the, of the, the issues at the heart of it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, uh, a very uh, eloquent summary. Well, not summary, but reflections, I think, which are very important issues. Uh, as you say, uh, this uh, has highlighted many questions that uh, we'll be continuing to address through the Mr. Geopolitics program over the next uh, four years. So I wanted to conclude now by uh, thanking our speakers from the program uh, very much for the excellent presentations and our special guest, Johan Schillerhuena, for opening up and being part of the panel. We really appreciate uh, all of your time. And finally, to thank uh, all participants for, for joining today and for the questions you've post, posted. Please do continue to follow the program. You can see the website and the Twitter uh, hashtag there. So with that, I'd like to conclude our webinar. Thank you, everyone.